This is on you. This is not on the doctor. You're the one sick, not him. All right? And, yeah, I think that that's quite reasonable advice. And I don't know. Is this legal? Can I say that? You're not a doctor. I'm not a doctor. What the fuck do I know? Yeah. Don't believe anything I just said. From the Asgard Company Studios in beautiful Wichita Falls, Texas, from the finest mind in the modern fitness industry, the one true voice in the strength and conditioning profession, the most important podcast on the internet. Ladies and gentlemen, starting Strength Radio. <laughs> Should have taken some caffeine. Didn't take any caffeine. Hey. <laughs> Maybe I can stay awake for starting strength radio. Friday's a good day for caffeine. You know, should have taken some caffeine. If I doze off in the middle of this podcast, that's why got some tea here you can't see that now but it's there tea's not really a source of caffeine you know i was gonna i was gonna ask I thought nah there's not any caffeine there's not any caffeine a little tiny yeah. bit of caffeine in tea but if you're one of these people that you know can't drink coffee after like noon because it keeps them up at night People like that are just fucked up. What you need to do, if you're like that, you need to just do a whole bunch of caffeine and get used to it. Because it's not normal to be kept awake at night by caffeine that you supposedly ingested 13 hours, 13 hours ago. That's not normal, all right? Something's wrong with you. A cup of coffee? What is it? A cup of coffee. You know? yeah. <laughs> I mean, who needs meth, right? Guys like that, you know, and even consider doing meth. Go just do Starbucks. <laughs> just go to go go to Starbucks, get the cup of coffee, take it out in the parking lot, park, turn the car off, and do the coffee. Before you get and, home and your wife sees it, yeah, yeah, don't let her see it. Doing and then, and you get home and you're all. Hi, honey. God damn. It's, have you been? Seem to have a lot of energy today. Have you been doing coffee again, <laughs> honey? You, you've been doing coffee again, haven't you? No, I don't know what you're talking about. I haven't done coffee in years. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> I saw a guy come into Walmart one night, real late. It was like one in the morning, and I was in there buying. Not usual groceries or something like that. <laughs> Fucking guy came in there, and he went back to the paint department and he bought some solvents and shit. And I mean, the guy was literally <laughs> touching the ground occasionally. Is all he was doing. He was so fucked up. And he, it, what's amazing about those people? They think you don't know. Right. Yeah. They all think you can't tell. Yeah, they've got silver paint around. Their, <laughs> I've been under their nose paint. and shit. Nothing wrong here. No. <laughs> oh, shit. It's so funny. Oh, anyway. All right. So today we've got a, a program that I'm going to try to jerk out of my ass. Every once in a while, I successfully jerk a program out of my ass. And we're going to talk today about you being more self-sufficient. Now, this would be me preaching to you from my vast storehouse of experience. And uh, if I were you, I would ignore everything I say today. Because uh, you're just going to feel inadequate if you listen to the whole damn thing. But first, comments. comments. From, from the stupid, stupid motherfucker. No. Comments, comments from, from the haters. That's pretty good. 
you think? Yeah. There's a little bit of drama there. There's some, yeah. there's some suspense. Suspense. Emotions are running high mm-hmm. in the room. Right. It's good. It's good stuff. There's, there's some literary shit going on. That's why you're up there and I'm back here. Right. Because I have the ability to jerk things like that out of my ass. Now, the actual substance of the program, we'll, <laughs> we'll see, but who knows? Oh, here's a shitty comment about Nick. We'll start with that one. <laughs> Nick can't say anything a white man can't say. He's not black. There's three negatives in this in this statement, and I can't do the math on that. Like, if so, it's a double negative, it's it like it's like minus one plus one. Right. Right. So we're back to back to zero. But I this is so. But the third one is Nick can't say anything a white man can't say. He's not black. Maybe this means that Nick is black. Yes. You think that may be what it... Now we're back to positive. Yeah, because we're a positive. positive. You are black. And everyone knows that black is positive. Right, right, yeah. Because if you don't understand that, then you're clearly a racist. So everybody, also, everybody's either black or white. Either black or white. Nick can't be anything other than either black or white because there are no, you know, in between. In between. (laughs) Let, decide what you're going to be and identify as such. Okay. Like our friend Ray Gillenwater. <laughs> now, Ray Gillenwater, our friend Ray, appears to be white. Oh, what is he? He's Jewish. Oh, shit. Does that mean he's black? Well, if he's Jewish, he can't be white. No, he can't be white. He's Jewish. He's black. So he's black. The only people that are white are Irishmen, I guess. Yeah. Or right. Germans, the Krauts are white, yep. right? Yep. That's why World War II was so damn difficult. Yep. It's hard to kill. It just looks like you're shooting your cousin. Right. You know? The Pacific part Pacific was, was all easy. sorted out. That, that was easy. Yeah. That was easy. But running around in Northern Europe, how do you, I mean, you know, yep. like shooting Cousin Fritz. I'd feel bad about that, you know. Okay, all right. I don't like <laughs> taking fitness advice from someone who has clearly never worked out a day in his life. <laughs> this is in response to the trap bar. Trap bar. Yeah. That continues to generate yep. wonderful yeah. comments from the haters. Yeah. The trap bar. That was just the, the, the people were deeply offended by yeah. that. More than the, the vegans. Yeah. Yeah, the trap bar guys are worse than vegans, yeah. apparently. That's I guess because it spans all food choices. Spans all. Food preferences, sexual preferences. Black and white. Black and white, yeah. Right? It's a universal. Spans all, all of that. It's a universal error. Right. It's a broadly distributed error. And people just get, you tell people they're doing shit wrong, and they just bow up. It's their life. <laughs> they just, they go fuck it. They just go ape shit, you know? Yeah, your trap bar is a pussy way to deadlift. <laughs> oh, it was there, you say. It's, you know, it's just, uh, okay, starting strength racks may not be safe or deep enough, but at least they're very expensive. Eric. That's good. Lewin, hey, Eric, I got some news for you, honey. <laughs> they're not anywhere near as expensive now as they're going to be before. Uncle Joe gets through with this economy. <laughs> just, if I were you, I'd get there. They're, look at it like this. They're on sale, sale right now. now. Yeah. Yep. All right. Just wait till gas is $6 a gallon. Yeah. Wait till diesel's $30 a gallon. Yeah. Try having it shipped. It's at 3 30 okay. yesterday, I think, in Dallas. Diesel was? I think so, yeah. Three something. Like seventy bucks. I saw it at two seventy nine uh on Beverly over there by the warehouse. Cheapest in town. Bought some for two sixty nine at Burke the other day. See, they're not they this is right. Y'all just Nick and I are 
talking about local shit here. Right. right. <clears throat> it's probably 480 in <laughs> California right now. I hope so. Yeah, Just have to hope. I mean, that's what they voted for. They voted for five dollar diesel. Good. <laughs> About a thirty dollar sandwich. <laughs> they voted for that. They, they just don't know it yet. That's what they voted for. All right. Uh, this uh, this is a real good one. Rip is so cute when he tries to educate those people with degrees. His entire system is literally one part of one class of one semester, and is entirely covered in one chapter of a degree in exercise science. There you go. I was just thinking you got to some sometime you got to read these as the guy who's typing them. Well, I, that's the way I read you think that. That's, one. How, he, that's yeah. how he okay. Yeah, he's sincere. Okay. He's sincere in his belief that Oh, I think he's very yeah. sincere too. Yeah. He, he's totally yeah. sincere. I, I you know, you can be stupid and be sincere happens all the time of course yeah. happens all the time and it happens quite frequently on comments from the heaters but to continue all right okay Mark should follow Rusty's lead and grow a man bun to cover up his pink scalp. See, now here's an example of why these people are the bottom 3%. Way, way over on the left-hand curtotic flat spot of the intelligence curve. Right? If I've got a pink bald scalp out of what should I grow the man bun if it was over on the side I think, I'm, I'm laughing because I'm, I'm picturing a, a fucking side that's a comb bun. over now <laughs> here let me try that <laughs> that help let's do that maybe the other side <laughs> still looks the same doesn't it yeah uh, no, nothing. all right Okay. Okay. Here, this is a this is a lengthy one. Rip, your res respect your rip, comma respect your strength training regime and coaching, but I just can't go along with you after you have expressed an anti-vaccination sentiment mm. and you disparaged my state of New Mexico. In addition to calling our governor a silly bitch, I remember that, which she is. I just call her what she is. Uh, is just a reflection of your own state's self-aggrandizing and need to demean in order to cover up a sense of inadequacy. Listen to all that psychology. Yeah. Psychological analysis. This gentleman seems pretty smart for a new Mexican. For a new Mexican who's never had psychology. Yeah. Uh. Uh, please see this URL for data showing New Mexico leading the nation in COVID response. Well, I don't. I, New Mexico is, in fact, leading the nation in COVID response. If by COVID response you mean locking down the entire state of New Mexico for months and months and months, that is it. That is leading the nation in COVID response. The entire state. I've driven. All the way east. Yep. And I've driven most of west yep. in the last year. That's the most fucked up state for COVID propaganda. It every, is. Every, three every miles, one of their road, road signs is just some bald faced lie on the sign again. You know, and he believes all this. He believes what he's told by his fucking silly bitch of a governor. And uh, uh, note how lacking Texas is. I got a. Did you see the... Well, our cases are spiking, aren't they? Oh, wait. Oh, wait. They're dropping off. Weird. Three weeks ago... Oh, somebody posted an article today on... I put it up on the website. 
And uh, he's talking about Mississippi and Texas and what their what their death rate and their quote case quote unquote rate has done, and it, they're just they're just tailing off, yeah, going away, yeah. going away. Three weeks after everybody that had access to a keyboard was saying that Greg Abbott is a murderous thug. He's massacring the the bloodbath, you know, one hyperbolic bullshit statement after another about how everybody's going to die. And, you know, that's not what, uh, that's not what happened. That's not what was going to happen. And then this guy has the balls to, his link is to an NPR story. (laughs) 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 After 10 years of association, I am unsubscribing. Thank you for the gains. It's rough when they unsubscribe. It's rough when they unsubscribe because you haven't been able to subscribe for 10 years. So, oh, this association, he says. So, man, it's, it's, man, it's tough. That really stuck it up my ass, didn't it? Yeah. I'm sure you'll, you're feeling that loss. Oh, it's just, you know, fuck. What are you going to do? Go along with the lies? Yeah. <laughs> well, we can't do that. All right. Here's the last one. This is a good one. Mark looks like an obese, diabetic Kurt Russell but Kurt Russell in Tombstone if Kurt Russell couldn't ride a horse on account of his weight and not being to feel toes to get them in the stirrups. (laughs) Now that is a classic (laughs) comments uh, from from the haters. Yeah, I all this new mess. had it all up in there. He just, and had, to just had, to had to get, get it, out. it out one way or another. Yep. Get it out some form or another. Just get it out. And all Either comes out as diarrhea or vomit. He doesn't care, but it's got to be released. <laughs> <laughs> as you may have noticed, the past year has been... I, to call it a clusterfuck is to insult clusterfucking, right? I mean, it's been so far past that. And a lot of people that had ever thought about this before have been dragged to the conclusion that possibly they were not really prepared for this, you know? They weren't really prepared for the situation that developed. Now... You can say what you want to about why this situation developed, who caused it to develop. I have my own theories about it. But none of that actually matters because once the situation has developed, and it certainly as hell has, uh, you have got to deal with it. And... Lots and lots of people weren't prepared to deal with this craziness. Either either physically, in terms of preparation, or psychologically. All right? Uh, The psychological is probably the harder of these things, the psychological preparation for this involves your understanding that you are being lied to virtually 24-7, 365, and expected to believe it. You're being lied to. And when I tell you that you're being lied to, that may well be the only thing that you'll hear all day that's not a lie today. <laughs> you're being lied to, my friend. You're being lied to. And one of the hardest things for you to do, because of you know our upbringing here in this country, 
is understanding that you're being lied to and that you're being lied to even though that's not supposed to be, be the case, is it? You know, when we were raised, nice little boys and girls, we were taught that everybody's honest and when somebody tells you something, they they mean it. And that uh, you've got... Uh, You've got to assume the best in everybody, and if you don't have something nice to say, don't talk at all. That sort of shit, you know. This this rosy scenario thing that we're all raised with, and it's it takes a, a quite a bit of reorganization to get past that, doesn't it? You've you've got these um, as a, as a result of that upbringing, you have built into your brain. Um, the willingness to believe what you hear. That's just part of society. It's part of our society. It's not part of everybody's society. But uh, in terms of uh, American culture, it's it's part of what we do. We just, book, you know, you say you'll be here at 830, and then you'll be here at 830. And uh, what you have to understand is that if somebody tells you they're going to be here at 8.30, they may have no intention of being there at all, much less not being there at 8.30. You, we, have, we are being lied to on a repeated basis every day, all day long, about virtually everything. And, uh, and I'll refer back to the, the article that, we, we talked about a couple of shows ago uh, about the big lie versus the, the small lie. The small lie is told with the, for the purpose of getting through a situation that exists right now. You show up late to the house. You tell her, nah, I've left my phone on the desk. I'd turn around and go back and get it and stuff. And, you know, little bitty bullshit things like that. And, and you don't want to call attention to the lie, so you immediately tell the lie. And then you say, so what are we having for dinner? You just gloss over it and go on about your deal. That's the small lie. And the big lie is a whole different animal completely. The big lie is told for purposes of establishing a new reference point. Okay. Global warming is going to wipe out all life on earth. Right. And, and, uh, you know, COVID-19 has got a, it kills virtually everyone that gets it. So it's important to take your vaccine, which is totally safe. It's been proven to be safe and effective. And one lie right after another. And these things are not just told to get somebody out of a, you know, being late from work. It's they're told to reset the paradigm. This is this is Orwellian, 1984 kind of things. And you people are going to have to get used to the idea that you're being lied to and that you don't just swallow the hook, you know. I mean, it was baited with stink bait anyway. You shouldn't have been attracted to it. You should have been smart enough to understand this bullshit when you see it first. But some of you have swallowed the hook. You can't do that because then they own your ass. All right? And, uh, and so... I think a lot of what I'm about to talk about involves you coming to, to grips with the truth of the matter that there is very little truth going on right now. Uh, and, and if you don't know it to be true for sure, then it's probably a lie. Anything you hear on NPR or the BBC or any of the broadcast networks or Fox News is a bald-faced lie. If PBS, if NPR tells you that the sun is coming up in the east tomorrow, demand the peer-reviewed study because it's bullshit. 
and uh, and you've got to you've got to turn all that shit off. Those of you that leave the TV on all day and just let that let this this sewage run into your face. It's even if you don't believe it, like you'll sit there and tell me that you don't believe it. It's affecting you, whether you want it to or not. It's programming. This is one of the interesting reasons why in 1984 you couldn't turn off the view screen in your house. Remember that part of it? You couldn't turn it off. The elites were allowed the freedom to turn off the view screen, but not you. Because if it's running into you all the time, it's changing your brain. So the first thing to do is be aware of that. All right, stop. Stop letting them lie to you all day long. Turn it off. It's all bullshit. There's nothing on there to learn. You want to learn the news, get online and read. And be careful about that. Because <laughs> the, the fucking QAnon fuckers are just as destructive to the reality of the situation as the mainstream media and the state-run media and the Pravda. They're just as fucked up. They're taking advantage of this situation. And they know that you'll believe the worst. But if if you believe what is not true, then it doesn't matter who told you the lie. You know? So that having been said, what are you going to do? When, uh, and I'm not talking about when shit utterly hits the fan. I'm just, I'm just concerned about what you're going to do to put some distance between yourself and dependency on these people that are lying to you. There is a way to approach your situation that does not entail, uh, being dependent on multinational corporations for everything. And, uh, <clears throat> and that doesn't marry you to someone else's schedule and someone else's um, ideas about what you ought to be doing. You ought to be able to do things for yourself. And in order to do things for yourself, this requires a certain amount of physical independence from the system. Okay. If you have to go by Walmart on the way home every night for a little something that you think you need, you're dependent on the system. You know, you've got to learn to make plans. So about a year ago, everybody decided that toilet paper suddenly was an essential item to have in the house. Suddenly, wiping your ass became of great interest <laughs> to everybody. Now, somebody that had planned better, like we did, already had toilet paper in the house. I keep 100 rolls of toilet paper at the gym and the house anyway. You know, not because COVID-19 is going to, you know, eradicate human life from the planet, but because you're, you're supposed to have enough sense to know that, that in the event of something untoward happening, you still need to wipe your ass, right? So you keep things like toilet paper around. Well, that should have provided a wake-up call for those of you who had not made it not made plans, and it should have been a situation where uh, other things started going through your mind. Uh, so we're going to talk about some of these things today, and uh, I think the uh, best place to, to start is with the most expensive, most important thing, and that's where do you live? What is your housing situation? Okay. Now, if you live in Manhattan, you're fucked. You've been fucked for quite a while. You 
have decided a long time ago that other people were going to be in charge of your existence. And I guess you're fine with it if you're still there. People I know got out a long time ago. But more importantly, if you live in Manhattan, you live in an apartment or some version of an apartment. You're crammed in close to everybody around you. You know, big cities all over the world are the same exact way. Uh, if you live in a big city anywhere, you live in London, you live in Jakarta, you live in uh, Buenos Aires, Buenos, Buenos Aires. Pretty good. You like that? Yeah. You live in Mexico City, for God's sake. Did I say that right? Mexico. Mexico City. City. Ciudad. Ciudad Mexico. Is that how they You're actually You're like an NPR Almost. broadcaster. NPR. You, just, you, you just notice switch. that. You just switch. You use just, the proper accent. For, but only for that Spanish way. language words. Right? Because <laughs> it'd be fucked up to do it for anybody else. For, right. Can you imagine? That, bring up a Chinese name. Right. Oh, sure. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I wish that NPR would interview me because I would uh, insist on having my name pronounced Charles Marc Ribdeau because it's a French name, right? <laughs> Ribdeau. No, I insist. I mean, why does why do Spanish surnames Garcia? Right? We have to be Garcia. We can't be Garcia. <laughs> Because everybody whose last name is Garcia insists on it being pronounced as though the person addressing you was also Hispanic, right? right? This is a good point about the, Hispa the, the Spanish. I never noticed that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's only it's only, it's only, Spanish. only Spanish names. Yeah. Because that's all they have figured out at NPR. <laughs> Nonetheless, okay, if you're in a big city, you're already, you've already fucked up, okay? And just, you know, you've learned this year that you've just had to deal with that because there are giant limitations. Now, a lot of people have decided that that was wrong. And a lot of people have bailed. Try buying a rural piece of property damn near anywhere in the United States right now and see what has happened to the price of it. I mean, here in the most ridiculous little 100,000 market in the United States. In Wichita Falls, Texas, houses are going for 10% over list price. That's stupefying. We sold it's ours. stupefying. We sold ours in uh, the, the night that we listed it. The night you Without listed? Any, the pictures weren't even up yet. And it sold. Yeah. And... Nick moved out into the country, kind of. Kind of. But the idea is that if you live in Chicago, Wichita Falls, <laughs> the middle of town in Wichita Falls is kind of like being in the country, isn't it? Yeah. And if you live in Wichita Falls, Iowa Park's kind of like living in the country. <clears throat> now, I moved out of town when I was 19. I never liked being in town. I, and I've been out in, quote, the county ever since. I was, there was a period of a couple of years I lived in Wichita in different apartments, just throwing around trying to decide what to do, and then moved back out into the county and have been there. You know, basically, I'm 65. I've been out in the county uh, 45 years of my life. I never, never wanted to be around a bunch of other people, especially while I was trying to sleep. Hotels really creep me out, but what are you going to do, you know? Yep. So uh, your housing would be a good place to start taking stock of its viability. Uh, and the viability of where you live varies with where that is you're stuck in the middle of Brooklyn and are less impressed with how hip that is now, uh, you kind of 
have uh, missed the opportunity to get out of there cheaper. But you still have to get out of there. You know, that, that whole thing up in New York is, if they close down three tunnels, you're there, right? Is it three tunnels or four? I think it's three tunnels. The fuck off of that island. You're there. They shut down those three. Let's say some clever young lad figured out a way to blow up all three of those tunnels. And those people couldn't get out. They'd be eating each other. Human flesh would be for sale on the sidewalks of Manhattan within two weeks. How many people are on Three million? Eight million? I don't know. The, the total population, I believe, of New York City is about eight, eight that's and a half all million. Bur- that's, all bur- that's all five boroughs. Right. Uh, Manhattan Island, I don't know. I have no idea. You, you've got that Let's marvelous see. device the there. Oracle. Consult the Oracle, and we'll see how many are there. 1.63 million. On Manhattan Island. Yeah. You know, and the place just isn't that big. No. That's a hell of a bunch of people all breathing the same air. Uh, amazing thing, amazing thing. I, why that fascinates people, I don't understand. And look, it doesn't even have to be the it doesn't even have to be the tunnels or the bridges. Uh, power, no, that's just a power outage. That's just a you subways know, go down. A metaphor. If you're yeah. stranded in a situation like that, there is too much pressure on now artificially limited resources, yep. and that is a recipe for cannibalism. I'm telling you, yep. it's uh, it's a you need to be thinking about. It. It's the first thing to consider. Where do I live? How long can I stand to stay here in adverse conditions? And if that can be improved, how do I improve it? Now, I realize that by the time you get to be sixty years old, by the time you get to be forty-five years old. Moving gets to be a whole lot more difficult than it was when you were in your 20s and 30s. All right, if you're in your 20s and 30s, moving doesn't bother you. But the older you get, the more serious any perturbation in your schedule is. And this is just the way people are. All right. Uh, if you're 80 years old and you're living in Brooklyn, you aren't going anywhere. You can't even conceive of that. You know, it's a if if you're 80 years old and somebody makes you move, it's like the end of the fucking world. You know, it's just a giant, giant. The more scheduled, more old you are, the more scheduled you are. The more you begin to depend on daily routine. I know this from personal experience. Daily routine becomes precious to you. Because it's stability. And when you're 25, you don't give a shit about stability. You want the challenge. You want things to be different. You want to dig in and experience as many different things as you can. So 25-year-olds move all the time. But once you're old, you can't do that. So if I'm talking to you and you're 40, you need to give some serious consideration to what the hell's going on. Before you stay there another 20 years and the situation deteriorates even more than it is now. <clears throat> now, uh, this is a good time to point out the fact that here we are a year into this shit. All right. And I, you know, you may think, and you may be absolutely correct that I am uh, doomsaying and being unnecessarily pessimistic. Not one thing I'm going to tell you today doesn't apply to everybody, everybody's situation, whether or not it's the end of the fucking world, okay? It's better to be self-sufficient and as independent as you can stand to be just because it frees you from constraints that 
people who are under the thumb of other people have upon them, and you don't want that. And I understand if you don't think like this, that's fine. Turn me off because, you know, I, I'm just, you know, I, I'm not going to agree that the greatest city in the world is a good place to be. Never has been a good place to be. Uh, you get used to it, but there are too many things you can't do, like drive, <laughs> right? So, well, you got to you got to remember that it's it, it's life is always trade off. So it, mm-hmm. the problem is that a lot of people haven't even thought this way about their situation. No. So if if you no. you know obviously if you're in a if you're in a, a, a situation where you can't where you have to be in one of these places at least understand the problem understand that you have to be there not that you should want to be there right understand a lot of people figure that out about six months ago and that's why you can't give an apartment away in upper east side manhattan right now the The, damn things are vacant because people figured out you don't have to actually live there to work yeah everybody learned that everybody learned that the hard way using your big big lie analogy it's the uh it's the idea that you are going to be taken care of and that that's the lie you know we Mm -hmm. we all we all think that everything's going to be just fine and that it would be great if that's actually what occurs but you have to realize but it might not not. it might not you know now i didn't start behaving this way way i behave way the things i'm going to describe you today uh last april you know i've lived out in the country basically the majority of my life because I didn't want to be subject to the whims of neighbors. And, uh, you know, it may turn out this year that that was a real smart thing to have done a long time ago, you know, but even if it doesn't turn out that way, I still like it better out there. That's why it's worthwhile to listen to you though, because you've, you've, lived this kind of lifestyle for a long time long time and for somebody who's never thought about it uh i've done all the thinking for you yeah so let's say you've you've you know moved into a situation where your your uh housing situation is not uh at the mercy of a bunch of fucking idiots all right and uh And you don't, uh, you're not beholden to anybody else, and you've got your, you, you're happy with your, your housing setup. Several of the things that, that you have to have in your house need to be thought about, all right? Electricity, for example, is uh, a wonderful thing to have. Ask anybody in the 1860s what they think about that. And they'll tell you that, yes, it's better to have electricity. Now, where are you going to get your electricity? Well, I, my situation in particular, I have, uh, I have two places. I have a place uh, here in Wichita County, way out in the county, and I have on-grid electrical out there. Uh, and... I have a place in Colorado, up in the high country in Colorado, and I'm off grid up there. Both places have electricity. Two completely different systems, two completely different sets of calculations about what system to have. In, in here in Wichita County, I'm hooked up to the electrical grid. I have uh, a service that runs down my little county road. Uh, that I had to pay for when I when I built the house, the uh, electric company put the line up my hill to the top of the hill. They put in a pole transformer, and then buried the service up to the house. And then uh, I set up my house just with regular house current, and I've got. Uh, I got a couple of 220 breakers. They used to have a, an electric range in there when I first built the house. I'll talk about more of that later. Uh, 
But it became apparent a long time ago out on my hill that uh, if there was a thunderstorm and we took a lightning strike on that on that pole, that it would uh, blow the fuse on the pole and I'd be out of power until uh, Encore could come out and fix the thing back up. It's their equipment on the pole that doesn't belong to me, so they're responsible for maintenance in the thing. So uh, it occurred to me that, I, yeah, I could get on the cell phone and call Encore and wait, and they're pretty good, really. They show up within an hour usually and turn everything back on. But what if I'm out of town? What if I'm out of town? I've got freezers full of meat. I've got a refrigerator inside. All that stuff's off. And if I'm gone for three or four days or a week or two weeks or whatever, and I don't have a way to back up that electric power, then I'm going to lose all of that, all of that investment. So uh, I bought a backup generator. It's called a standby generator, and it sits on the, on a pad outside your house right next to your electric service. And the way these things work is they sense the drop in the power coming off the pole. And usually it's about five seconds after the drop in service to give it time. Sometimes the service wavers and stuff, and it's not really an outage. So they wait five seconds, and then they turn on. And the, there's, a, there's a battery that starts the engine that operates an electric generator. And what you want is one of these things that uh, is powerful enough to generate enough current in the absence of of uh, the grid power to at least power your freezers and uh run on uh run your air conditioners and stuff because if it you know you've got kids in the house and the power goes off in the middle of august it's going to be 98 degrees in the house around here here pretty quick so you've got to you got to accurately assess your demands, and you've got to match your generator output for what might actually need to be run in the absence of uh, power from the grid. Now, typically, these generators run on propane. You can set them up in town to run on natural gas too. And depending on your situation, either propane or natural gas are probably going to be the uh, the fuel that you're going to operate this this generator on. Now they make big, more expensive units that run on diesel. That's going to require you to inventory a bunch of diesel in a tank. And one of the problems with that is you've got a 2,000 gallon diesel tank or a 500 gallon diesel tank, and you don't run the generator that often. That diesel gets old and becomes kind of a problem and doesn't work very well. By far, the more efficient way to do this is to have a propane tank. Uh, natural gas, if you're in town, is fine, but what if the natural gas is gone? Problem with being in town is, is that I don't know of any municipal uh, jurisdictions that will let you have a propane tank on your property. I don't think they want propane tanks in town. Now, it's some unincorporated places probably are fine with it, but for instance, here in Wichita Falls, you can't have a propane tank, a big propane tank. You can have one the size of operate your gas grill, obviously, but, but a big permanent 250-gallon, even 250-gallon is a small propane tank. Uh, mine at the house is a 500-gallon tank. And on the rare occasions where the power goes out, we've got backup electricity from the generator. And I uh, wouldn't be without that. I wouldn't be without it. I, it. We use it all the time. It's terribly important if you're going to be out in my situation to have a standby generator. Now, uh, here's a little helpful hint. There are two main manufacturers of 
propane standby generators in the United, in the United States. Kohler and Generac. Do not buy a Generac. Do not buy a Generac. They're the worst customer service in the industry. Their owner's manuals are unintelligible gibberish. <laughs> they do not support the electricians that actually install their shitty-ass products. I, the one I bought, the first one I had up at, up at the cabin, the day that thing was installed, it started leaking oil. And I had those guys come back out about four times, and they couldn't get it quit leaking oil. Always Brand a new? giant mess all over everything. Brand new one? Brand new. Damn. Brand new. Leaked oil first day. There's no excuse for that shit. <laughs> you know. So I replaced that with a Kohler up there. Love it. Just got a new Kohler here. So if I was buying one, that'd be what I'd do. I'd get a Kohler. Um, and again, propane, if you can find it, if you're allowed to own it, you want your own propane tank. Now, if I were you, I would have a 500-gallon propane tank. I would not have a 250 they can only fill a propane tank to 80% because of the because the pressure is involved in a completely full tank. They'll only fill one to 80%. So a 250-gallon propane tank with a 250-gallon in, internal volume holds 200 gallons of propane. A 500-gallon propane tank holds 400 gallons of propane. That's all they can get in it. All right. And... If, you're, if your standby generator comes on and has to run a couple of days, you're going to, and, and you're the least bit low, a 250-gallon tank is going to be right at the limit of its capacity pretty quick. So I would have a bigger tank. Now, most of the time you can rent a tank from the propane provider, and it's real reasonable. They continue to own the tank. You rent the tank for $60 a year or something like that. Or you can find a used one and buy it and own the tank. That's probably the better way to do it. And, uh, yeah, I would, I would immediately have plans made to do that. Were I going to uh, have a, a situation like I'm talking about? Now, our situation in Colorado, we're off-grid up there. We have a solar power system up there solar power has gotten cheaper recently it's much more reasonable than it was 10 years ago solar cells are being manufactured at a, at a higher volume and they've come down quite a bit in price uh up there i've got a 3000 watt array on the roof of the house and i've mounted it on the roof of the house because the orientation of the house is such that that angle is good for the sun and you when you start talking about solar power these things become critical that angle of of incidence from the from the sun has got to be within a certain tolerance of 90 degrees in order that the cells operate efficiently uh it's interesting that up there the the position of the sun across the sky during the during the day is more efficient for generating power in the winter than it is in the summer because it's more coming in more of a straight line into 90 degrees to the solar panels and then uh what you have to have in addition to that is a place to store the energy that you're that you're collecting off the roof during the daytime and this means you're going to have to have a battery array. So I've got uh, an array of eight six-volt deep cycle batteries, just changed over from wet batteries to AGMs a couple of years ago. And this is what allows you to operate for two or three days in 
the event of a snowstorm that covers up the solar panels. Uh, it allows you to store power for use at night. You still have to be prudent with your use of electricity in a situation like this. But we haven't really had a lot of problems with it. And especially these new batteries are, have been really good. I'm real happy with these. Now, we also up there have a propane standby generator exactly like we like the one we have in Texas because in the winter if you get a snowstorm and the roof is covered with three feet of snow and it doesn't clear itself off the tiny little bit of electricity I'm using in the house over the winter is going to pull the battery array down after several days and uh this one is set up to, to kick on. The generator kicks on when the batteries drop, drop down below about 49 volts. So, uh, and that generator charges this, the batteries? This generator charges the batteries and charges them, and it cycles on and stays on until it gets the battery array back up to, I think it's 56 volts. They're 6-volt batteries, but... 48 volts is the nominal voltage of that system, but, you know, it's they'll hold more. than. So those of you electrical guys know more about this than I do, but uh, the the thing comes on, it fully charges the batteries. And then you, you're back up to operating at full battery strength again, and you've used some propane, and so I've got a 500-gallon tank up there. Now, why would I not put a solar system on my house in Texas? Because it doesn't amortize. It doesn't amortize. Uh, even with lower prices for solar cells right now, you've got to have a bunch of infrastructure to operate one of these systems. Uh, you've got the panels themselves. Those have to be installed you got to bring them down, bring power down off the roof and stick them into your battery system. And then the batteries, which make DC power, the solar cells, which make DC power, have to be up converted to AC in a system that also is necessary for using AC power in the house because all your appliances are AC. And you're going to have to have AC power. So there's, there is transformer type equipment. Uh, it's called an inverter, and it uh, changes the DC battery power into AC power and powers the house like that. All of that's expensive equipment. Uh, I think you could probably buy the system I've got right now up in Colorado for probably fifteen thousand dollars, but. Look at it like this. My home electric bill in Wichita County last month was $56. It's going to take me a hell of a long time to pay for a $15,000 system rather than just stay on the grid for $56 a month. My, in fact, the way I've got my house built, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, the way i got my house built, my biggest electric bill last summer in 100 degree plus temperatures was like $185. So these are some considerations. Now wind power, I wouldn't even consider wind power for a home thing. It's a mechanical device and those things break. They just fucking break. You know, but moving parts, that sort of shit, they just break. I wouldn't even think about a wind turbine generator system for a, for a home application. Not at all. Uh, my house, better do this before I forget about it. I live in a house that I designed and built back in 1999. It's got, it's a stone house. It's got 18 inch thick stone and concrete walls. Uh, there's a 125 yards of concrete in the slab, in the footings, in the in the uh, carport i got it's a hell of a bunch of concrete in in all the whole structure it's not going anywhere 
thick walls like that make a heat sink. And it's very easy to keep that house cool if you don't let it heat up. It's very easy to keep it cool. I've got a double metal roof on it, a double insulated, double metal roof. And it's the house is just like an ice chest. I've got, uh, I don't even have actual windows in the house. I have glass blocks, double thick glass blocks in the, where the windows used to be. So I've got a pretty energy efficient house. I'm the greenest guy in Wichita County. <laughs> Doesn't that make your heart warm to know that? Uh, so this is, some, you know, we'll put that back in the first category of housing. If you got the uh, option of building a house, there's ways to build it that don't cost a lot of money up front because this was a cheap house to build. I built it out of riprap, you know, construction limestone. And uh, concrete's relatively cheap, at least it was at the time. You dig a house into the side of a hill. There's a lot of ways to do it that don't involve one of these multi-gabled, you know, all this attic sprays to heat and cool and everything. Looks stupid, look like a hive, you know. These gable farms, I call them. So, what do I do about water out there? I uh, have never had a water well out there. When I built that house, I built it with the intention of using my roof to catch rainwater and gutter the rainwater into a water tank. Uh, a, a tank that is used to hold drinking water for household use is referred to as a cistern. So I have started off with one, and I've got two cisterns out there now that sit on concrete pads above the ground. I have a total water capacity of... 7,100 gallons, which is, you know, under shitty circumstances, about a year and a half's worth of water. If you are careful with it, which you have to be in a situation like this, I'm not on the water grid. They can't turn me off, in other words. So they can turn off my power, but then I've got a backup generator. They can't turn my water off. They, uh, I, I have my own sewage system, so I'm I'm totally self-contained out there. Uh, one of the things that I that I did do that was, well, I got some good advice from my plumber. Is when I set my cistern up, uh, and I set my uh, septic tank and my leach lines up. My leach lines are only. 100 feet long. I've only got 100 feet of leach line. And out there on that hill, that's plenty. Most systems that you have now uh, pump the, they use a two-stage tank, and then they pump the effluent out and broadcast it out onto the, onto the yard where it evaporates. Is that what yours is? Mm -hmm. Those things break. Mine is just a simple gravity flow system. So my leach lines are over a bed of gravel in a 100-foot-long trench. Never had the minutes worth of trouble with it because my gray water goes out on the ground. My, my washing machine water goes out on the ground. My, the gray water from showers and lavatories and kitchen sinks goes into the sewer because you've got to keep it wet right? Black water from the toilet goes into the sewer, but the gray water from the washing machine with soap and bleach and shit in it goes out on the ground down the hill. The bleach is what fucks up your septic tank. If you put a bunch of bleach in your septic tank all the time, you're going to have to have it pumped out. My septic tank has been operating for 22 years without any maintenance at all. They theoretically can go forever without any maintenance because they're self-contained units if they're designed correctly. So keep that in mind. Also, you'd rather not have to be hooked up to a sewer, to a city sewer, 
because any service they provide you, they can take away. Okay. So that's the water. I don't filter my water. It's just rainwater. It's distilled water. You know, it's uh, one word of caution. Distilled water will eventually, over time, eat through galvanized. I'm going to have to replace that first. The 22-year-old tank needs to be replaced. I've got some little weepy spots coming through because distilled water is thirsty water. Mm. There's no ions in it, so it will osmotically pull the the shit off the side of the tank and now it's there's little some rusted through spots and that's just going to get worse so i'm going to have to deal with that here pretty quick that's the next major project out there <clears throat> okay now let's see that's all of the housing shit most of it if i think of anything i'll i'll back up and throw it in now let's talk about Food. Food's important. Everybody likes to eat, right? In my opinion, the most important thing that you can have, and it, it once you get this and you understand how free it keeps you from the grocery store, you will wonder how you got along without it, is a chest deep freeze. They get down to 15 below. They're terribly, terribly useful. Terribly useful things. Uh, I've got an 18 cubic foot, which is a big one. Uh, they make them bigger than that, but I, most people don't have room on a wall for a bigger one than that. Uh, I've got a nine cubic foot. I've got a couple of those. I've got a total, I own a total of one, two, three, four chest freezers. And I try to keep them full all the time. Now, chest freezers operate way, way colder than the freezer on top of your refrigerator. Those things get down to about five degrees or maybe zero if they're not, not disturbed. But if you're wanting to keep a whole bunch of meat in a, in a viable condition for a long period of time, they have to go down way colder than that. You can get a chest freezer down to 15 below. Now, this allows you the luxury of buying meat on sale in big quantities. You repackage it so that there's not any of the meat that's not in contact with the wrapping material or it'll freezer burn. Freezer burn is a dried out piece of, of the cut of meat while it's in the freezer. And that has to be cut off and thrown away. If all of the meat, when you bring it home, let's say you find a bunch of hamburger on sale and you bring, you buy five, five pound chubs of hamburger meat. You bring it home, you divide it into one and a half pound packages and you put that on a piece of plastic wrap, get all the air out of it and wrap it up real good and tape it shut. And package those, pack it, make them flat so they'll thaw out fast when you want to use them. Those things will keep for a couple, three years maybe. Beef freezes very, very stably for years at a time. And uh, venison does the same thing. Venison keeps basically for, I've eaten five-year-old venison out of my freezer and it's fine. It's perfectly fine. Uh, the trick is to store it correctly. There can't be any air. There can't be any broken seals. Can't be any air in contact with the meat itself or it'll freezer burn. That freezer burn will grow down into the meat and you're going to waste a bunch of it if you do that. So when you buy it on sale, bring it home and make sure that it is uh, wrapped up correctly. And you're going to put this in your deep freeze. Now, I don't like a stand-up deep freeze. Uh, a lot of people prefer those because they have better access to all the stuff, to the shelves and shit. But they don't hold as much meat. They don't hold. There's just not as many square feet in the things. And every time you open the door, all of the cold air falls out in the floor. 
they don't operate as efficiently as a chest freezer does. You ought to be able to find a chest freezer for a little one for $185 and bigger ones for four, four fifty, something like that. They're worth every penny of it. Because once you get into this and you make contact with somebody that that is in the whole beef business, you can buy a side of beef at a time and have it processed and take delivery on it and put that in your freezer. And the first time you buy an entire beef, and when I say an entire beef, I mean a steer. If you buy a beef, you're talking about buying an animal, the whole animal. The first time you do that and you pay a dollar twenty a pound for him on the hoof, and then you have him killed and you have him processed. Uh, 1,400 pound steer turns into probably five, fifty, six hundred, six hundred, six hundred, six hundred point five pounds of meat wrapped and frozen. The first time you do that, you've paid for the freezer probably twice over because the amount of money that you have saved. Uh, having bought the thing on the hoof, all right? And, uh, you, yeah, you'll make money with that freezer over the years. You, you know, you, what you do is, is you get divorced from the meat department at the grocery store. You start making other connections and buying your beef elsewhere. Now, those of you that have been out to my house and eaten with me know that I keep mutton, sheep meat. I keep sheep in the freezer. Uh, and everybody around here that's participated in this little habit I've acquired will tell you that their aged, mature mutton is better than any beef they've ever eaten. Agree. I've, it's, yeah. it's amazing. It's absolutely those, those sheep chops. Those are the goddamnedest things you've ever had. And uh, I'm paying three hundred dollars a piece for those for those sheep, hundred and twenty five for the processing, and they hang for two and a half three weeks, and it's the best shit you ever had. Those chops are indescribable how good they are. And you know, there's other other things you can do. There's other things you can do. You can uh, put game. You can shoot deer, depending on where you are, elk, antelope, all of that meat keeps very, very well at at a very low temperature for a long time. It's a stable source of protein that makes you independent of the grocery store. And it allows you to more thoroughly control the quality of the food you're eating, too. Now, keep this in mind. Pork does not keep like the other red meat does. Pork does not keep that long. You can put a pork roast in the same 15 below chest freezer that you've got your beef in. And a year later, it won't be any good. So if you're going to buy a pig, eat him pretty quick. Don't wait around on him. He's not stable like beef is. Uh, you can buy show pigs. See, you'll get plugged into the into the 4-H community, and if you become known as somebody who wants to buy a steer, they'll call you. After show season, they got to sell all those animals. And uh, you uh, have to develop a relationship with a custom kill plant as it's called custom kill where they where they kill the animal for you and process it uh hang it as hang the sides you want them to hang a while we do a whole show on beef aging i think we talked to eric about that when we did the beef show and uh you can uh you can take uh you know, sheep, goats, you could probably do go. I don't like goat meat, but there are 
There are meat goats available. There's lots and lots of options once you get plugged into a custom kill situation. And you can, you know, you can find sheep. You can find, uh, if, if you're not picky about the quality of your beef, you you expand your your uh, resources quite a bit. Uh, for instance, a you know dairy breed steer. He's not going to be any good for anything more than hamburger. But if you want 500 pounds of hamburger, you know, he would be easy to buy. You and several of your friends can go in on him because now you guys have got a place to put a whole bunch of hamburger meat if you've got your chest freezer. So think real hard about buying one of these things. You have to have some room out your garage for it. And by all means, if you've got a chest freezer... Check it every once in a while. Every once in a while, the compressor fails, you know, especially if they're older. You need to check them and make sure they're still running. And have backup juice hooked up to the things. That's That would be the best plan there is, all right? What else in terms of food do we need to think about? Um I think the Mormons have it all down with the grain storage sure, thing. Yeah, dry goods. Uh, you know, Wheat. That's been talking about wheat. Wheat, wheat. oats, yep. rye. You can use it as the berries or you grind it into flour. What else? Uh, those are they're real stable for storage materials. Uh, put a five gallon bucket of wheat. Yeah, put a piece of dry ice in the bottom of that. Put the wheat in on top of it and set the lid on top of it. And next day you set it down and the CO2 has evaporated, oh, right. have driven all the oxygen out of the wheat. Now you've got a real, real ultra stable 20 year plus long yep. unit of, you know, bunch of wheat. Yep. And, uh, that's a real good way to, to have grain. I mean, Grind it into bread, bread and hamburger. And you have hamburgers, not cheeseburgers, but apocalypse. hamburgers. Yeah. hamburgers. Yeah. So uh, these are some things you need to be thinking about. But you have to have the tools and the deep freeze. The chest freezer is the is the primary tool for these things. Water we've already talked about. Now, what do you? There are storage items that you need. Uh, that you ought to have on hand all the time. Uh, you ought to have some bleach on hand, a couple of gallons of bleach, because bleach sterilizes things. And there are circumstances under which ster sterilization might be very, very important to you. I would keep a couple of gallons of bleach. Uh, I would get the normal bleach, not the thickened kind that doesn't splash that's got other shit in it but i would when i get my two storage gallons of bleach i would put those things in a plastic tub like a rectangular plastic dish tub and the reason you do that is because every once in a while a bleach bottle will leak i've had it happen you may have had it happen and you want that to leak not all over everywhere, but just into the tub where you've got those two gallon bleach bottles stuck. All right. I would certainly do that. Keep those things in a gallon in a, what would that be? A five gallon wash tub? Yeah. Plastic. Yeah. It's plastic. That would be, that'd be what you want to keep these things in. And, uh, the, You'll find uses for the bleach. I think I'd also have some iodine around just for first aid purposes. If you have to sterilize water, if your water becomes contaminated, you can sterilize water with either sodium hypochlorite, which is bleach, or iodine. And the instructions for doing that in terms of the dilution are all online. But you can make water safe to drink even if it's contaminated using both of those substances. And I think it's important to think ahead like that. Uh, tools. 
as a general rule, anytime you need a tool for a little job, buy the damn thing. If you need a tool for something, buy it. Chances are very good. You're going to need it again. Don't borrow tools. Buy your own tools and collect them. Even if you only use it once every five years, you might be in a situation where you don't have the opportunity to go buy it next time you need it. I would have tools. I would have an air compressor. I would get an air compressor. Air tools are useful. You need to be able to blow up to inflate your tires. There's all kinds of things you'll use an air compressor for. Um, you can buy those things at uh, Lowe's or Home Depot. I've got, uh, I had a pancake one just with the one tank. Right. I had one of those. It didn't seem to be particularly sturdy. Had to end up giving that away so i bought one of the what do they call the thing with the two tanks that are stacked on top of each other i don't know that it has a different name well it's not a it's not called a pancake it's a pancake is just a little flat one it's the flat the yeah. little flat one it's light duty home right. deal this thing uh that i've got well you can run paint guns and anything else off of it you can run probably a, a torque wrench off the thing air wrench but i it, it you can blow things off with well, there's all kind of things you'll use it for you need one of those you need one of those and if you got electrical backup you'll always have that compressed air you can air up a flat tire you ought to get one of those there's going to be a couple hundred bucks but they're worth every dime of it it's one of these things you're just thinking ahead okay uh dog food ought to have a supply of dog food you know unless you're in manhattan in which case Feed your neighbors. Feed, 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 your neighbors. feed your neighbors to the dogs. Yeah. A little bit at a time. It's right. kind of rich. Yeah. You don't want to make them sick and then puke all over the floor. You put the rest of the neighbor in the deep freeze. Yeah. Process the rest of the neighbor. Once again, get all of the air out of the package so he doesn't freeze or burn. I'm, you think I'm being funny? No. no I, I, look, I, I'd eat a neighbor if I had to. I know. Mm hmm. I know how to cook a neighbor, too. Depends on the part, right? Depends on the cut. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Sure does. Medicines. You ought to have a supply of medicines. And that, that that's an interesting thing. If you're real inventive uh, and you really want to do this, you're, what you're going to do is come up with a little list of medicines that you'll actually need. For example you ought to have a supply of doxycycline. Commonly very useful antibiotic. You ought to have some doxycycline. You ought to have some Bactrim, which is uh, sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim. It is a, uh, it's an older antibiotic. It's very good for all kinds of things. Uh, you're going to need three or four different antibiotics because not everything responds. Not all diseases respond to the same same treatment. So Cipro would be a good one to have if you really, really needed it. Uh, uh, Macrodantin is a good uh, thing that's used commonly for urinary tract infections. All of these things uh, are prescription medications. But what you're going to do is be clever. And you're going to get them from the the boys that call you on the phone every evening about 6 o'clock that want to sell you Viagra. That's who you buy these things from. When Canadian pharmacy calls and there's an Indian, Indian gentleman, guy. an Indian gentleman on the other line calling from Canada, he's going to try to sell you Viagra. You ask him, how much is doxycycline? And he'll say, doxycycline, hold on. You say, those are 50 cents a piece. Well, I want 180 of those. And he'll take your order. And you give him a list of these things. And he's no more interested in you having a prescription for these than he is in you having a prescription for the Viagra. And he'll sell it to you. Okay? This is inside secret. Don't tell everybody this. But those guys are useful. 
you know, use them to build up your store of medications at home. Because you, you, if you get strep throat, you don't need, to, and it's Friday, you don't need to wait till Monday to get to the doctor to get medicated for strep throat. You need some in right now, or everybody in the whole building is going to be sick. So you go ahead and have that with you and learn how to learn what to do with this stuff. You're going to have to get educated. If you're going to have this stuff, you're going to have to get educated. But we have the tools now to to have the information we need to effectively use this stuff at home. Yeah, and I'm telling yeah, right, the doctors are now all pissed off at me. But since when has that bothered my ass? You know, I'm pissed off at them. You know, yeah, I'm telling you to keep a supply in the house of antibiotics that you have bought on the black market, that you have taken the time to learn how to use and use them correctly. This is on you. This is not on the doctor. You're the one sick, not him. All right. And yeah, I think that that's quite reasonable advice. And I don't know, is this legal? Can I say that? You're not a doctor. I'm not a doctor. What the fuck do I know? Yeah. Don't believe anything I just said. I was kidding. <laughs> Don't do that. Only doctors know how to use medicine. Right? And let's see. I'm told kind of the basic commodities. Oh, what kind of car or truck do you drive? Well... I'm of the opinion that if you're going to have one vehicle, now this, of course, is you city people are going to disagree with this. If you're going to have one vehicle, you need a truck. You can carry people and stuff in a truck. If you got a car, all you can carry is people, right? You the, If you don't have a pickup, then chances are sometime this year you've borrowed one of your buddy's pickups. Get your own. You know, you need a pickup. And your second vehicle should be a car. Now, what kind of truck would I have? Well, depending on where you live and where you travel to, obviously the most universally useful vehicle is a four-wheel drive, three-quarter ton truck. Three-quarter ton truck's a towing vehicle. If you have to pull a trailer, you can pull a trailer behind your three-quarter ton truck. A half-ton truck is basically a car with a bed. I'd get a three-quarter ton four-wheel drive truck. Now, opinions vary about whether diesel's more useful than a gas engine. Uh, again, this is going to depend entirely on what your, what your situation is, where you're going to use it. If you live in North Dakota, where it's 40 below zero, a diesel is hard to keep running in those kind of conditions because of the nature of diesel, the fuel will gel in extreme cold. Uh, gas is useful at pretty much all temperatures. Uh, but I, I prefer for driving around on a highway a lot. I prefer a diesel truck. Uh, I've got a four wheel drive diesel truck. And again, uh, it's a three-quarter ton truck. It's a it's a four-door, long wide bed. It's a big truck. Long wide bed is a four by eight between the wheel wells bed, and uh, and I've got a two-wheel drive truck that is also a four-door diesel. Both of them are four-door diesels or Dodges, and they've got the five nine Cummins diesel in it. This is a when he's running, <laughs> it's, a, it's a damn good engine. Uh, it runs that, that four wheel, that two wheel drive truck I've got runs down the highway nicer than any Cadillac I've ever driven, and it's a it's a it's a nice nice pickup for the highway. Long wheelbase, long beds, very stable. Just drives down the highway nice. Gets twenty one miles to the gallon, which is decent gas mileage, you know. Now, the four-wheel drive truck doesn't get anywhere close to that kind of gas mileage because modern four-wheel drive trucks are turning the all of that assembly in front is 
is turning as it rolls down the road. It's not engaged to the engine unless you put it in four-wheel drive, but nonetheless, all of that assembly in the front is still spinning, and there's a lot more friction, a lot more resistance, a lot more weight. So that, that truck gets about 15 miles a gallon. But uh, if you need a four-wheel drive truck, and sometimes you will need a four-wheel drive truck, then a two-wheel drive truck will strand you and require a tow truck when a four-wheel drive truck will not. So this is something to keep in mind. Now, if you live in Florida and you're good about staying out of the mud, you don't really need a a four-wheel drive truck. But if you're going to be anywhere where it snows, this ought to be something that you consider. Uh, four wheels is, is way, way, it's, it's amazing how much more effective that thing is when the road is slick than a, uh, than a two-wheel drive truck. Just absolutely amazing. If you never had one, never driven one, you'd just have to, to experience it to see. I wouldn't go back to not having a four-wheel drive truck. And then if you, once you're, once your truck is all straightened out, uh, then if you want a car, you get a car. You know, get a car, it gets pretty good gas mileage. You know, uh, I, my personal preference for cars and trucks is a manual transmission. I don't own anything with an automatic transmission. I just don't. You know, but it's, I'm hard-headed that way. But uh, Manuals are a lot cheaper to fix. You have to fix them. Clutches are cheaper to install than whole new automatic transmission so uh these are just some some considerations uh let's see in terms of tools you want to have tow chains and a floor jack and some stuff like that that allow you to get under there and work on the things make sure you've got good spares for cars and trucks You know, every time you change tires, you ought to take the best tire that you're changing off of the truck and have that mounted as the spare. And I've recently taken to carrying my spare tire in the bed of the truck. Because if you need it, you know, things sucked up under the bed of the truck. Takes 15 minutes to get it out. Takes 15 minutes to get it out. If you can get to it, if you're not stuck in the mud, you know. It's a giant pain in the ass if it's up under there, and it gets mud thrown up on it all the time. And you never think about the spare. You never check the air in the damn thing. And 90% of the time, that spare's going to be flat if that's where you carry it. Yep. So uh, I plan B is carry the spare in the bed of the truck. Anyway, what else? What am I leaving out? Well, it'd be good to have stuff to dig yourself out. Shovel. Yeah, yeah. if you're going somewhere where there could be an issue. If you're going somewhere where you anticipate using your four-wheel drive, you ought to have a shovel with you. Yep, shovel. No doubt about that. Um, you can get those those tread things, little mats you lay down. Yeah. Well, if you got four-wheel drive, you probably don't need that. Probably don't need that. If you're stuck in a four-wheel drive, that's not going to work. Right. But you ought to have a shovel. you got a shot at it with a shovel. Shovel, yep. Uh, and keep good tires on the damn truck. Right. Put 10 ply tires on your truck. Load range E is what that's called. Load range E, the 90 pound tires. Don't put shitty tires on your truck. Uh, again, the type of tire is going to depend on the use. I sure do like Toyo tires. Those damn things are, they're, middle of the road in price those are the best tires i've ever i've been driving toyos for 25 years and they're just damn good tires for the money they're the best thing you can do changes the whole feel of the of the ride it's amazing how good those are you know for the fast cars you can't put them on there but the the damn things are good tires for uh, less money than you would pay for michelin's and they probably roll better than Michelin's. Yeah. Uh, what other helpful bits of advice do we have today? What I wanted to do today is just to, 
get you started thinking about what you're going to do if things get worse than they are right now. And they may not. They may just, everything may just be just as right as rain by the middle of next week. Could be. But none of what I have told you is a bad idea anyway. If you've got to go by Walmart every day before you go home because you have not made better plans than that, you need to start thinking a little bit differently about the time spent on these on these little chores that you don't need to do. You don't need to decide about dinner 30 minutes before you're going to eat it. You know, you got to make plans for these kinds of things. And... Uh, if we've given you any helpful suggestions, I hope we have. I encourage you to think carefully about all the stuff we've talked about and start implementing some of these ideas into your particular situation. Uh, improve your situation if you at all can. Those of you that are getting these stupid-ass $1,400 stimulus checks from these criminal cocksuckers in D.C., that's not even... That's not even declared as income. Don't spend it on beer. Okay? Spend it on something useful. Some of the shit on this list that I've talked to you about today. You're going to need it eventually, and you might as well take the opportunity now to buy it when it's less painless. If you have to buy this shit when you have to have it, that's not as good an idea as buying it now when you don't have to have it. Okay? Thanks for joining us on Starting Strength Radio and uh, watch your ass, all right? Later. Later.